think everybody's returned after uh, our dinner break. Thanks for uh, being fairly timely. <laughs> we had we built in a little slack time, so we're doing good. We have one book left. Uh, if you were thinking about buying it, they're there, but obviously you can order them online too for the first aid book. I want to uh, start the second part of the session here with a brief uh, thank you to um, Don Scharf um, and to Larry Hiller too, but Don in particular, I was on a hike with him, call it a hike, uh, with him and Brian Kennedy about a year and a half ago to his famous peak, Apache Peak. And um, of course it turned out to be 23 miles and ah. 12 and a half hours and a, a very technical snow traverse to get onto Ahern Glacier. So on the way back we started talking about safety and what is encountered in typical glacier park climbs that are off trail. And, and so I said, do we do many education programs? And he said, no, but I'm hiring a person who uh, is an American uh, Mountaineering Guide Association rock guide, and he's potentially studying for the full certification. So when he gets here, I'll introduce you to him, and we can get him to uh, maybe get involved with GMS. That was a year and a half ago, and um, Robert moved into town last spring, was it about a year ago? Or? Uh, yeah, two. this is the second winter. Okay. We, we came here in, in August anyway. So. All right. Yep. So um, we began discussing this opportunity to put on an education uh, program, and uh, the results are uh, before you, and Larry, uh, being the chairman of the climbing committee um, in one of his many jobs helped me to put this together as far as all the logistics, getting the room. Uh, he's good friends of Gil Jordan who runs the museum so we got the room for like totally a discounted price because we had our display here last year. So I want to thank Larry. Let's give Larry a hand. For that. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, some of your donations uh, certainly help um, uh, give a stipend to Robert um, because he is a professional guy and uh, he's climbed Mount Rainier in the neighborhood. He never gives me a firm number, but it's over 50 or 60 times working as a guide for Rainier Mountaineering. Um, he's climbed Denali, the Grand Tetons, many, um, not maybe first ascents, but certainly difficult ascents. Yep. Uh, guiding. Uh, trips and I think uh, we're all going to learn a lot. Uh, we had a meeting about last fall, I think, and I came up with this long title. Um, but we wanted to focus on issues that we as GMSers come across quite frequently. And so I thought group dynamics. How do we coordinate as a coordinator, as, as each of us volunteer to be as coordinators of a climb, how do we really coordinate a group? Uh, we've kind of limited the group sizes, maximum to 12, but what does it take to really be cooperative within a group? In other words, everybody has input, but to still have some guidelines. And then I came up with a second title, Alpine Protocol. What really does a guide service do? How do they keep their groups together. And there's a big difference. Obviously the clients are paying for a guide service. You go through a tremendous certification process, which Robert is going to discuss in, in uh, detail here as we get going. But we wanted to combine those two so that we can learn things. We're not going to be as strict as some of the guides have to be with their clients, but I think we can all learn some of those basic protocols that can help ensure better protection and better safety for all the participants. So that's, in, in a uh, nutshell, partly what the purpose of this second presentation is all about, as well as enjoying this, uh, vicariously some of Robert's many adventures in alpine terrain. So with that, I'm going to introduce Robert Montague, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. <laughs> So 
So that's uh, that's my cue. So I'm Robert. For all of you guys that haven't met me, and if you have, you've probably met me at RMO. Um, and it seems like Don is at the center. Don Sharp is, but also you and. Um, so I'd like to thank Don as well just for bringing me into the loop here with the climbing community and the Flathead. Um, my wife Jenny grew up here and we moved here, uh, I guess it was two years ago, just about two years ago now, uh, from Bozeman and we've kind of been living there for a while and, and going out of the Tetons a lot. But it's been real nice to just yeah, be welcomed in here, so I appreciate that. And thank you all for having me. Um, so yeah, so this is, uh, this picture if you're wondering is Denali. Um, and this is a group going around a uh, spot called Windy Corner, and it's just kind of a fun picture. I was um, an assistant guide on this trip, so I'm on, on another rope. That's a one rope team in front of us, and I'm the second rope back, and just saw this picture, and we're moving at a slow enough pace with all that weight that I had enough time to get a camera out and snap a shot. <laughs> but it's just, it's a cool spot, and um, I just, uh, yeah, really, I, this place is really cool. I, I can talk about it forever, just even this one slide, and I'll just keep moving along. <laughs> um, so this is the title that I came up with. Because <laughs> it, it was kind of a mouthful. We weren't ever really totally um, comfortable with the title. But, but basically, you know, I went for a run the other day, and was just like kind of processing the talk, and like thinking, well, what it basically comes down to is style matters. And in the sense of when you use that in the climbing community, it means the style in which you climb. Are you climbing alpine style? Are you climbing capsule style? Did you red point it? Did you first descend it? Did you free it? You know, whatever all that stuff is. And some of that maybe won't apply as much to GMS climbs, but um, it definitely plays a part in the decisions we make about climbs we want to do. Um, so, and this is me, this is my introduction slide. This Montague Mountaineering is kind of something that uh, I'm doing in my, in conjunction with my training with the American Mountain Guides Association. So, the AMGA um, is kind of trying to mimic a program that's going on in a lot of the rest of the world, but that started in Europe, and guides operate independently there and, and not necessarily as part of uh, a guide service that employs them. And so this is my um, start at sort of just becoming my own independent guide. And I still subcontract with guide services, and I use their permits to guide in their terrain. Um, but I, through the AMGA, I'm also getting, gaining access to permits that they hold that I can use on my own. Um, and my background, basically, I in I, the first time I ever did any rope climbing, I went with a guide in England uh, on the sea cliffs in Cornwall, and that was my first introduction to rope climbing. And then, that, you know, I was pretty young then, and no one in my family climbed, so nothing really happened after that. But I, he took me from never having gone climbing on a rope before to leading and placing my own gear uh, within five days. And that was pretty amazing. And he was free soloing the stuff that was right, you know, he was climbing the routes next to me as I was placing the gear, which gives you an idea that wow. the routes I'm climbing at that point were not hard. You know, he was very comfortable in that terrain. But at the same time, he had, had a lot of faith in me and in his ability to, to teach me the important aspects of climbing. And so I think, I feel like I, I can credit him, and I think of him often. I, I don't know, he was an old gentleman at that time. I don't know if he's still around, but um, I, uh, I think of him often because. I feel like uh, that kind of started things. So when I moved to Washington State uh, in 2000, I started climbing in earnest there. I bought a rope. I went out in the cliffs. I bought the guidebooks. And I started getting into it. And then in 2004, I got hired on with Rainier Mountaineering. And that was sort of, that started my apprenticeship with guiding. And I've been guiding since then for about nine years. And um, most of that time I spent uh, five or six full seasons on Rainier, and that's basically close to four months guiding trips uh, full time. And so that was a lot of time on the rope, on the glacier, with people, learning the rope, so to speak. Uh, I've also, um, I'm an EMT, and because you have to have some sort of first aid training as a guide, uh, EMT is a little bit above what you need, but it's nice. and. Um, I've also worked pro patrol with Big Sky um, Ski Patrol down in Bozeman, and I learned a lot about avalanche control work there. Those guys are actively setting off slides and looking for the weaknesses, and, and you learn a lot that way. 
And it kind of is, fits in my philosophy of just, if you want to learn something, you got to get in there and be the practitioner. you got to do it, and then you learn it. Um, so I also uh, have uh, an avalanche training up to level three, which is sort of the highest year in the States. And um, that's a prerequisite for going through some of the AMGA training. This is a picture of Mount Rainier, um, which, you know, it's funny, so like that first slide of Denali, you know, I, I think collectively in five trips, I've probably spent close to six months on that mountain. And, uh, and here, I mean, countless days I've spent on that mountain. And you, so you build up a relationship with it. And just like some of you guys build a relationship with Glacier Park, you know, you, you know the weather patterns, you know the animals, you know the flora and fauna, you know the peaks, and it sort of becomes familiar and you're comfortable there, and, and that's part of why you want to take people out and show them that. So um, this is a, I don't know if you see the guy down here in the, the bottom, it's a friend of mine, we were doing a ski tour in the Tattoosh Range, which is just behind us in the picture here, and uh, it's just this iconic shot of uh, Rainier with a little cap on it, uh, early springtime. Uh, so my presentation kind of goes through, I'll get some sort of talking slides and then I'll have a picture like this and, and that'll be the part where I digress. <laughs> so AMGA training, so here's a little flow chart. Um, so like I was saying, so I have a level three cert and you'll see that's here and here. So at some point as you go through, you start down here at one of these. Uh, programs here, and these programs are uh, about a week long, like seven to ten days, and consecutively, um, and they run, you know, once or twice a year. So, you, in other words, you you take like you take your single pitch rock instructor course, um, and then uh, you could take. It's possible you could take this course that same year, but unlikely because between these two, you need to build up another new resume of climbs that you've done since then. Um, so this ends up being, you know, several years of time, and, and I'm on the protracted schedule myself. I started my first course in 2004, and it doesn't take most people this long to do this program, but I just, uh, yeah, other things have gone on, and I'm still working on this. I have, at this point, so I've done this right here, Rock Guide Exam. Um, and so what this means, uh, and if you do all three of these, you end up here at IFMGA, which is the International Federation of Mountain Guides Associated, or something to that effect. And that gives you a license, reciprocal license, in, say, the Alps, which is where a lot of uh, your work is going to be. But it also gives you reciprocal um, uh, work credit in Canada, for example, too. So those would be two sort of hot spots for guiding. Um, and the U.S. is becoming more and more so. So, in other words, in order to become um, IFMGA accredited, we have to give those guys access here too. And that's a, an issue that the AMGA is working on um, because our access is just different. But that's a whole other talk. Um, so, I started here, went through this um, rock guide exam. Basically, means. You're, you can guide up to two clients on a rope, pitched, um, you know, grade four routes, which is routes that take all of a day, so that's the technical aspect of it. Think Yosemite, big walls, you know, long routes, um, up to 510 in difficulty. So these are sort of the, the, the standard that they're assessing us at. Um, so this is, that's that, and then I've been through da, 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 all the way through here, and each of these courses has an aspirant exam component to it. So at the end of the course, there's two days where they, um, in the exam process, you, you show up, there's a little bit of review, but a lot of it is, here's an assignment, guide me and your fellow uh, examinee on a route, and then I'm going to switch places with you, or I'm going to put the other examinee on the front, so as the guide, midway through a route, and then you don't know which one which part of the route you're going to get first. So you need to be prepared to guide the whole thing. Does that make sense? Um, so that happens here. But in other words, it kind of gives you a little practice session. OK, aspirant exam. So, so I'm here. I've registered for this for this fall, uh, which I'm really excited about because it was tough to get in. They're only offering one exam this fall. Um, and that will take place in the North Cascades. And then I've also done, uh, let's see, these, well, that one because it's also here. But I've uh, done this course too. So in other words, to get here after this fall, I just have two more courses. And 
we'll see what happens there. Uh, I'm not necessarily holding my breath on that one. <laughs> but it sure seems close when you look at all this. Like, wow, okay, cool. So um, that's kind of how the AMGA training works. And, and not all guide services require that training, but a lot of them do. And it's since I started taking their courses in 2004, it's, I've seen it become more and more the norm every year. Um, young people that want to get into guiding, it helps hugely if they've taken one course from the AMGA. You know, and they show some interest there. Um, so here's some factoids. It was founded in 79, so it's older than you may have realized. Um, currently, there are 87 IFMGA guides in the United States. And that doesn't include, you know, people like me who have one or two certifications. Um, and then these are, you know, this is the mission statement. Um, you know, one of these is, oops. Um, one of these is the mission statement, this one here. Inspire is an exceptional client experience. It's the premier source for training, credentials, resource, stewardship, service for professional mountain guides and climbing instructors in the United States. Uh, the big thing here is this, right? So this is, when it, what it all boils down to is, is client experience. And so much of, you know, the AMGA teaches us a lot of skills. How do you, you know, get somebody up in school, rope trick, and, you know, that sort of thing. But where you learn what we call soft skills in guiding, the client experience is on the job. Spending time with people, you know, taking people out on trips, taking people out in the mountains, and just sort of seeing what happens. Because that's the part that you just, it's hard to, to train for. So that's the big thing why I wanted to include that in there. Any questions about the MGA? Do you have to do something to keep up your certification? like? Absolutely. So that's a really good question. So, so the AMGA is it's it's developing, um, and you'll see that any if you look around sort of just in industries in the, around the world, um, that's a common theme. You need to keep up your certifications. You can't just get your certification and then you know oh, well I got it. You know you need to do continuing ed. If you're a nurse, um, which I'm studying up here at FECC, you need to do your continuing ed as an EMT. You need to do continuing ed hours. So the AMGA is now starting to enforce uh, a continuing ed component to it. They hold an annual meeting that is in different locations around the country um, every year in October, and part of that is offering people clinics, guides, you know, guides clinics taught by other guides on different skill sets and things like that. Anybody else? Anyone else taken an AMGA course? No? How many people have heard of the AMGA? How, how did you guys hear about them? Just it was Freedom of the Hills. Freedom of the Hills? Yeah, just reading about Yeah, first. cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about the, the, the program. And, I, and I, I've, I've been a full supporter of it since I joined in 2004. Um, it's, you know, guides can be critical of themselves. Anyway, that's another story, too. <laughs> Here's a cool shot picture. This is, I, I took this picture. At, and I, I'm psyched on it. <laughs> I was skiing with this guy and I just like, I had stopped and turned around. I, for some reason I had the camera in my hand and was ready and just pow, took this picture of this little point and shoot thing. I couldn't believe that, that I actually got all this snow exploding around him at just the right moment. Fantastic. Um, but anyway, he's a, a guy named Trevor who uh, lives up in Canada. This was at the Stanley Mitchell hut up in Yoho. Have any of you guys been there? Yeah, that's a long way in back there, isn't it? <laughs> I didn't go in the winter, so. <laughs> yeah, in the winter time, it's a long ski on a flat forest service road for a while. So here are the, the takeaway points from tonight. So I get down to the nuts and bolts of things and, and kind of what I want to tr uh, transfer to you guys as far as, you know, what I think that you guys will pull from the information I'm going to talk about. So style matters. Um, and kind of there, it basically is like, well, what's the, you guys just need, as coordinators, you need to decide what style you want to climb in. And it can be, it's not a complex answer, it can be really simple. It can be like, well, I just want to have a relaxing day out in the mountains. That's a style. And then communicating that to your, um, I don't know, I guess I'll call them clients, but they're not your clients, but folks that come on your trip. Uh, next point is taking care of people. This is, um, if there's any one lesson that I've learned from the, the old guard in guiding, it's this. The things that the, the, the guides, the, the young guide will tire somebody out really quickly. 
and then and we'll come back and be like, there was no way they were going to make it. They just weren't fit enough, you know. <laughs> and I've climbed with older guides who have gotten people that I thought there was no way they're getting to the top of Mount Rainier, and we just walked slower, and that's all it took. And taking care of people means they've got you know these are the three main things. So I. I I made this up. You're not going to find this somewhere else. I don't think. So SPF, right? Like your uh, sunscreen. Shelter, pace, food. So something easy to remember. You're on the trail. You're wondering, why is this person having such a hard time? Think about these three things. Shelter, pace, food. Have they eaten? Have they drinking something? Right? Like these are things you like routinely throughout the day. People forget to do this stuff. You can't just forget about somebody and expect them to go the distance. Um, pace. Are they walking faster? Did we, did we like go too fast in the beginning and they you know, got really sweaty and hot, got blisters, and now everything's just falling apart? Um, shelter, do they have enough clothing on? Are they getting super sunburned? Because they think it's a really nice day out, but they don't realize that they're just getting cooked from all sides by the snow that they're walking on. That, you know, things like that. Um, so taking care of people, because people, you know, as the guide, you're in charge. Of, you know, you're the experienced one. You're the one that's going to you know, help someone out. So, is any of this ring a bell for folks? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, yes. good. So, out of curiosity, how many folks here are coordinators for the GMS? Great, okay. Um, and, okay, well, and the third one is professionalism. And, and that one is, is maybe, is sort of the more ambiguous one, um, in the sense that, this, uh, it definitely applies to guides because it, it, it's your job. And you know, if you want to be taken seriously, you need to take yourself seriously. And that's sort of, you know, again, I, I'm digressing a little bit. But professionalism um, goes a long way to building trust with people that are out in the mountains with you. So if you show up prepared and ready to go, then people are gonna try and follow suit. And, and some of the stuff that, that I do prior to a climb um, that I think helps with some of this other stuff, with like having the, um, the uh, attention to pay. Like, so in other words, if I've taken care of other things ahead of time so that I don't have to think about them while I'm on the climb, then I can do more of this, which is super important. I can only do when I'm on the climb. Okay, enough about that. So expectations of a guide. So this is where you guys get to kind of come in. I've got some things that are going to float in from the side of the screen, but this is the part where you guys get to sort of tell me what, when I say I'm a guide, what are your expectations? If you were going out with a guide, what would you expect from me? Leadership skills. Okay. Knowledge. Knowledge, yep. Navigational expertise. Good. So, yep. And An else? extra chocolate bar. And Good chocolate, chocolate bar. bar. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what I got. Okay, professional, prepared, experienced, training, accountable. Oh. Wow. Right. So, so we need to talk about any of that stuff. Not necessarily. I mean, that's kind of what you guys what you guys said. Any of that? Does anybody have a question about any of that? Does anybody not make sense? So, all right, another talking point. Uh, this is, so on Mount Rainier, um, which is where this picture is taken, there's a, and, and don't worry, there is a rope. Right I was wondering. Here. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is what we do for fun. Um, this is a, like a rest day, so to speak. Uh, this is an area called Abraham Flats. Um, it's on the DC route. How many of you, you guys climb Mount Rainier? Have you climbed the DC route? No. no? So you, you've been through Ingram Flats. You've walked uh, uphill of this crack, um, where it's much smaller. But, um, but you've walked right through this area. In fact, I think that this is probably Little Tahoma right here, um, which is a sort of satellite peak on the side of Rainier. Anyway, um, giant cracks on Rainier. That's one of the, the cool things about Rainier is the, the just, yeah, the amount of glacial activity that goes on on that mountain um, so far south. Okay, so this is, uh, I didn't come up with this. this is Conrad Kane. Uh, have any of you guys heard of Conrad Kane? Kane Hut, the Bugaboos, named after him. Huh. He's uh, a pretty infamous Canadian <laughs> plant, and actually he's, 
probably, he's probably from Europe originally, which is, I, I'm guessing where he was trained. Um, but he did some amazing first ascents in the Canadian Rockies while guiding clients. Uh, one of them, which is the, the cane route on uh, Bugaboo Spire. Anyway, some, uh, some stuff that, that, and this is, I take this um, right out of an AMJ handbook. So this is something that, you know, as guides we still, you know, read. <laughs> um, any of this stuff ring a bell for you guys? Or? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, he's, he's an amazing guy. I mean, history's full of people like this, right? I mean, these things that um, just stand the test of time. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the chocolate bar, I feel like, kind of fits in right in here somewhere. Right? <laughs> you know, you gotta get the chocolate bar out and then sort of tell like them. Right after short notes. Coach somebody <laughs> through something. Okay, so here another picture. Um, this is in the Tetons, and uh, this is a, a kind of cool route, and um, that, that's me there with skis on my back. This is the, um, oh man, I'm forgetting the name of the cool art. It's on the middle Teton, oh, the Ellingwood. And uh, it is so much steeper than I thought it was. <laughs> when we were down here, and we, um, do you guys know Brandon French? Yeah. Okay, so this is with Brandon French and, and another friend of ours, um, Kevin Grove. And uh, we came up through here, and uh, this is, it, it, how, how many of you guys are familiar with the Tetons? Somewhat? The Tetons it basically consist of like, uh, it consists of one canyon called Garnet Canyon. <laughs> when, at least when it comes to climbing. <laughs> I, I, sometimes I have a narrow focus, but... So in Garnet Canyon, you have kind of all the peaks that you would have heard of, including the Grand Teton, the Middle Teton, the South Teton, uh, Napier Se, Cloud Vale, which is right here. Um, and then this is the Middle Teton, which splits uh, the South and North Forks of Garnet Canyon. Um, so anyway, we came up this thing, and it was super steep, and uh, we got to the top, and then we saw the, the Middle Teton Glacier on the other side, and we skewed that. Okay, so here's another quote. Um, from a, a past guide, uh, Gaston Marie Buffet, who was a French guide, um, really famous, wrote some books and things like that, just kind of a neat guide. But uh, this, is, this is an important one to remember when you're planning your climb. And, uh, you know, and, and here's sort of where, where I like, uh, where I struggle, or, or I have struggled at least with, with putting this presentation together is, you know, if I put myself in a coordinator's shoes, you know, you're, you're volunteering your time to go out the mountains and, and take some people with you. It's, uh, you know, and it, I sort of think like it, it, it's my weekend too, you know, like I want to go out and do something that I want to do. You know, like I want to go out and have fun. I've got these peaks, these things that I want to do and, and I want to use the GMS system as a way, a venue to do those things. And that's where, you know, I think that, that um, the guiding and being a coordinator kind of separate. And so being a coordinator means you're going to need to be a little bit more thoughtful about, uh, you, yeah, I don't think that it means you can't pick things. I think it's more that once you do, you just need to realize that you've done something, you've made a decision that you want to climb something that other people may not be able to climb. Or the style in which you need to climb this peak, this is you know an all day, a one, a dude in a day, really long day, means I can only have a group of a size that I can manage that I'm comfortable with, which may be three people. And that's it. You know, things like that. Decisions like that were, are things that you'll want to make if you're doing things that you do want to do, that are at your limit, that are at, like, you know, things that are exciting to you in that sense, that aren't uh, things that are humdrum that you've done a lot. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, risk assessment. So uh, in this picture, it's, uh, this, so this is in Alaska, this is um, Mount Foraker, and you're looking at, uh, actually this, this is Crossing right here, and this is Mount Foraker, and um, boy, man, I mean, I, <laughs> there, there are routes all over this peak, so there is a route up this ridge right here. This, Foraker gets climbed maybe, uh, summited by like three people in a year you know, and 15 people sign up to climb it, you know. It's, uh, it, and yet it's right next to Denali, which gets climbed by hundreds of people. Um, 
it's just, it's much tougher. The, the easy route up Forker goes up this, which is a separate peak in and of itself. This is crossing. Then you go down the back and connect the saddle, the ridge, between this peak and this peak. And it's this super long, uh, double corniced, crevassed. There's actually crevasses <laughs> on this ridge. The, the descent route for any of these other routes anywhere else, anyway. So uh, for risk assessment, you know, like, I, I love looking at a picture like this and be like, okay, well, like, where is there a safe line? <laughs> Boy, I don't really know. Like, maybe right <laughs> up this thing. I, you know, there's definitely like crevasses in here, and you can see some rock. You know, this is just heinous, right? Like, <laughs> you know, I guarantee you, this stuff's gonna peel off and come shooting down here. And, you know, you can watch huge ice avalanches calve off of this face right here. There are no routes here that I know of. Um, you know, so Alaska is one of these places that, like, boy, I mean, you can just spend hours just staring at stuff, wondering if uh, what it would be like to be somewhere on this face. Pretty exciting. So some of this stuff is kind of like uh, you've read it. It's in Freedom of the Hills. It's you know, it's it's in your um, handbooks. Um, it may be labeled slightly differently, like objective hazard, subjective hazard. Basically, the idea is external hazards are the things that you don't have control of. They're the things that are out there in the mountains that you kind of need to plan for. Um, so, you know, oops, uh, is the hazard related time, day, season, location? You know, are, are we talking about weather, um, rock fall, trees, grizzly bears, uh, flooded streams, you know, like swollen rivers, that kind of thing? Um, so these are things to kind of, these are questions to ask yourself. Uh, just because there is an external hazard doesn't mean it's a no-go. You know, there may be a creative solution around it. There may be, you know, another way to deal with this. Um, so is your information complete and relevant? Do you have a current weather report? And this is a, this one, like, you know, we hear a lot from, from our friends, like, oh yeah, I went and did this, it was really cool. Or, um, yeah, I was up, you know, there's, oh yeah, totally, there is a log across that, that stream that you can cross, and it's like two miles up from, you know, here, and they know exactly where it was, and then you come to find out that was 15 years ago. You know, like, no way, right? Like, there's just no way that that, and are you gonna take people out there? You know, like, and be like, oh, well, I don't know where that log is. <laughs> What should we do now? That's the kind of stuff, like, as a guy, you, you really don't want to get caught there, right? Like, in that kind of predicament. So you, you want to do your homework. You want to make sure that, like, okay, you know, that, yeah, I, I'm not going to bet everything on a log, so I'm going to come up with another plan or pick a different objective. Um, how active is the hazard? You know, uh, boy, I mean, things that come to my mind that when I think of, like, how active are things are, like, how active is a, a gla uh, like an ice fall or a serac zone? You know, I mean, is this something where like if I sit here and take a 15 minute break, I'm gonna watch things fall down? Or is this the kind of thing where like, well, like, yeah, it's active, there's debris down there, but we don't see anything go into like but maybe once every week or once a month. Or this is something that, you know, this is a hundred year slide path that I'm walking in. You know, there's trees growing in here, there's no flagging, that kind of thing. You know, it's sort of that sort of thing, like gathering clues of like how active is something that you're thinking of. But that could be any of the external hazards that are out there. So, I mean, a stream crossing is constantly hazard this while it's elevated, right? But later in the season, it wouldn't be, or maybe less so. Any questions? If you guys have questions, please just stop me. But I, I can also, I mean, I can go to it. So, all right, so here's something in the park um, that's, uh, I believe that's, Ben Parsons right there. Uh, this is Mount Edwards, and I don't know if you guys, I don't know, what, how's the weather look? Uh, pretty good. It looks pretty good, right? Yeah, I mean, I can see, it, it's sort of, there is some cloud in here. I don't know if they're really showing up in the, in the projection, but um, you can see a little bit of blue here, right? You know, I mean, there's some haze, but in general, like, what, you know, like wearing shorts and, and tank tops and stuff, like, it was a nice day. Well, this day is the closest I have ever come to being struck by lightning. Um, and this is a picture of us uh, running, running back down um, in an absolute downpour. And that was like, that probably happened maybe 30 minutes after that first picture was taken. And I, it, it's, yeah, it's just one of those things, right? I mean, you sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it happens. 
But yeah, my, my wife and I were descending back down the ridge and we heard the, the thunder. And I don't know, at some point, um, yeah, it just like, it, you know, it was just this, I mean, it was electrifying, I'll just put it that way. <laughs> we're, we're both fine, no big deal, but it was, uh, it was enough to have our heart racing and running down this trail back to Sperry. Here's another external hazard. So, you know, obviously lightning, external hazard, weather, one of those things that can be unpredictable. Here's a crevasse. Um, I don't know how many, countless crevasses I've stepped over and I've only taken a picture down in one of them. Um, and I don't know how big this one is. It, it, this, this is the funny thing about snow is it, the scale is, can be, I mean, this could be 100 feet wide for all we know. It's probably a foot wide, <laughs> but it's nice and parallel and it's real black down there. Um, how many of you guys have, uh, have read Touching the Void. Yeah, I mean, stories of people falling into crevasses and then climbing back out. It's, um, their crevasses are just kind of funny that way. Um, you know, and, and I wouldn't know it except that having spent enough time around them, like you can see some snow building up down here. They don't just go straight, they're not just holes straight down. They, you know, you can see the stuff is like peeling off. See this like thin right here, it's like a fin. And it's malleable, and it, it's uh, it's pretty wild. So so that kind of stuff will collect snow and, and things, and it's just yeah, it's a very dynamic environment down there. Not a place you want to end up though, uh, if you could all help it. Okay, solutions to external hazards. So here's again, when you guys get to throw some things out there, um, let me know things that you guys do in your trip planning and, and in your climbing that that helps you avoid it. External hazards. Plan B. Plan B. That's really good. Anything else? It's super simple. Don't you guys? I know you guys all do it. I mean, bringing a raincoat. Yeah. Sunscreen. Be prepared. Be prepared. Yeah, we uh, for quite a few years. I uh, we purchased a thank you gift for all of our coordinators, and so all. Of we don't get a lot of money, but I try to get something that's nice each year. And so one of the ones we did was a little emergency bivy sack. It's like a space blanket, but uh, and first aid kit. Super light. Yep. Yeah. Throw it in the bottom bag, and it can double for a lot of things. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Headlamp. That's a great one. Yep. Anybody else? No, who you're climbing with. No, who you're climbing with. That that comes later because that's an, that all, that's what I qualify an internal hazard, but <laughs> or subjective. Uh, let's see what I've got here. So uh, check the weather forecast and and check it the morning of, and that's maybe pretty detailed, but uh, it's one of those things that I I do any time I go out in the mountains, whether it just doesn't matter. Like I just want to know what the weather's going to do that day. And sometimes that weather changes, you know, I mean, the forecast will change overnight. Minimize your exposure to the external hazard um, by route or pace. And in some ways I'm thinking here, um, a lot of like zones in the mountains where you're, you're going through where there, you're, you're at more danger for something like a slip or a slide down a slope or something rolling down from above. Um, you know, we, we all are familiar sort of with safe zones in the mountains, places where you feel like, yep, this is a place where we can just, we can set a tent and we can spend the night here and we don't have to be watchful. Have a plan B. Be observant and use, and I don't know if any, if you guys have heard of this defensive hiking, it, uh, I'd like to think I coined it, but I don't know if I have. This, this is something, it, it just in putting this lecture together, I just thought, okay, so, what do I do that, I, that I've picked up from guy that I do now all the time in the mountains? It's this, like I am like, I'm looking around all the time. Like I'm trying to decide like, is that rock and roll right now? <laughs> is that tree gonna fall down? You know, like, you know, is there an avalanche coming? Like I wanna know things as soon as they're gonna happen uh, rather than get caught by them, that sort of thing. So on Rainier, it's one of those things where uh, it's a rock fall hazard on snow. And anybody, I mean, and you guys will have that here in part too. What's the danger of rock fall on snow? It's quiet. Yeah, once that rock hits the snow, it can accelerate, but you're not going to hear it hitting other rocks as it comes down. 
So if you're not looking for it and it's coming down, you're not going to see it when it hits you. So that's one of those things that it now is just second nature for me. Like I'm just, I don't, and, unless I'm on a trail like in the woods, just kind of not, it just isn't, I don't feel like I'm exposed. I'm never just staring at my feet as I go. Um, I just, yeah, I always want to know sort of what's going on around me. Uh, so I think that's a good, good habit to get into. Okay, internal hazards. So uh, that's me being cocky. And uh, this, is, this is in Squamish. And, um, and I'm super nervous in this picture, but I'm not acting like it for my friends here. Because <laughs> uh, I'm getting ready to leave this next pitch, and it's, it's pretty hard, and uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to pull it off. Um, so internal hazards. And, and this is kind of where like, uh, you know, the, the introspection begins. Um, and, and these are things that, you know, as, as a coordinator and a guide, you, um, you just, you, I guess maybe some of it, like you do kind of on long walks, you just have time to think or you process with people and like you, you know, you, so you have this, maybe this history already of, of time doing these things built up like while you're, you're out enjoying the outdoors. Um, at least I know I have. And, but it takes that kind of time to build up self-awareness. And, um, and, and I'm sure all of you guys have experiences with people where you know they're not being true to themselves about something. They're making decisions uh, based on their ego or you know, out of their pride, um, something like that. And that's, those are sort of the, the, the times when you know, your, um, your radar is going off, you know, you're kind of going, uh, <laughs> I don't know if, if, this is, if I feel comfortable with this. And especially when you know, your life and limb or loved ones are in the equation as well. Um, so, and, and that's the kind of uh, responsibility I feel as a guide is, I'm taking people out who have families. They've got loved ones who want to see them come back. And maybe it was a huge, big deal for this person to come out, you know, and take this trip with us and be out here. And he's, you know, he or she has people at home who are really worried about them. Um, and I need to be on my game. I have got to be making the best decisions about the group and not, you know, summit or plummet. It's not, we're not going to do whatever it takes because <laughs> that's what I think everyone's here for, or that's, I want another notch, you know. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that, that's here in the internal hazard analysis. So we all need to do this ourselves, but we also need to recognize it in other people. Um, and, and, it's, and it's the hardest, if not, I, I haven't figured out a way to, to broach the subject with somebody if I feel like they're doing that, because it, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you guys have some better luck with it or some suggestions. How do you turn clients around when conditions are right? Sorry? How do you turn clients around when conditions aren't favorable? That's a great question. So uh, let's let's see if um, okay. So you guys have probably read through these, right? Any, are there any questions? Okay, I'm I'm not ignoring you, but I'm gonna get to that. Um, any questions on these things here? Is any clarification needed? No. Um, okay, let me go back because I I'm not sure that we're gonna go to it. So to answer your question. Uh, I prep people from the get-go that this is not a sure thing, and and it's one. And actually, maybe it is. Sorry. Okay, pre-trip me right here. So this is this is the spot where um, you know you you introduce yourself to your folks, and and in in my experience, I'm meeting people that I have never <clears throat> met before. I've never climbed with them. I don't know where they come from. I don't even, I mean, I have a very limited scope of their medical background, um, which, you know, it's, in a lot of ways, it's kind of unnerving in that sense. And I'm assuming that in, in GMS, you've probably climbed with some of these folks before. You have some sort of relationship here in town, like you know them just from around. Your kids go to school together, you know, you see them at work, that sort of thing. Um, so you have some, like, some relationship together. But basically here, you want to start building rapport with people. You want to um, let them know what the expectations, what your expectations are for the trip, for the day. So where are we going? What are we doing? Those are the basic ones. Um, some of the other ones might be, you know, the weather forecast isn't good. And that would be something, I don't tell every trip that, you know, hey, there's a good chance we're not going to summit this mountain this trip. 
um, because sometimes it's a splitter weather forecast and the only thing that's going to stop us is you know our own limitations. Um, there are other times where it's just darn right, darn right nasty and I have concerns and I'll voice those. You know, look, the weather is bad, I'm not going to lie, this is bad, like we don't summit in this kind of weather. So I'm just going to tell you that now, like we'll go as far as we can, but at some point I'm going to pull the plug on this because it's just, it's not safe. And, and most people agree with that. I have only once had somebody who, and they didn't, it wasn't so much they didn't agree, they just were really frustrated. You know, and I mean, I have stories from other guides of clients that just, you know, like just really, basically just had a tantrum, like they just didn't want to agree. So you, so sometimes you run into that, but I think in general, like everybody's on the same page about stuff like that. When it comes to safety and, and when the weather, if it's the weather, when the weather's really bad, that's sort of a no brainer. It's like, oh yeah, it, it's blowing in my face. Like I know the weather's bad. I can't see anything. Like. I, I understand that. Where it's harder is when somebody, um, when somebody, it, it's their own physical limitations, or you're um, you're turning someone around because you feel like they will become a liability later in the day. You know the whole thing of like the summit's only halfway, right? Like summit's optional. We got to go down. You know, like if I take you all the way to the top, you're just going to be out of it, and then you're going to be a real liability on the way down. And so I'm turning you around now before we do that. That's the time when people sort of feel like that's kind of an ambiguous thing. Like, well, as a guide, you, you get the last say. I don't know. It, <laughs> you, uh, it's, it's hard to say. That, and, I, and I don't know that that would apply. I mean, do you feel like, have you had a, a, an experience like that? Well, I came across a situation where uh, the route led up a, a steep snow slope and there had been some recent wind loading on it. And I didn't like the stability of the, of the slope. But, you know, I had some avalanche training. And the guys that I was climbing with, one of them didn't see the danger. And to this day, if he was here, he would still argue about this point, where I said, I'm not going on that slope. You know, this is our high point. But is he is he not because here because I of the decision the he made? Training. He okay. did. He didn't see <laughs> yeah. as the leader. Yeah. You know, and that was really frustrating. I bet. Yeah. So how how did that pan out in that particular moment? Um, did you guys turn around or? Yeah, we did turn around. around. I, okay. I prevailed in the, in the instance. Yeah. But, um, the the argument went on until the guy's death. On his deathbed. Wow. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. That's you know, a, it's, it was really tough, though, because I had more training and more knowledge, but yet that wasn't acknowledged. And avalanche hazard is one of those things. Um, I, I have a similar experience okay. on Denali where we, uh, and, and just to sort of give you the backstory, like Denali is, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit here, Denali is like your two and a half weeks up to high camp, and then you've got like three days where you, you have enough food and fuel left to hang out for three or four days at high camp and try and summit, and then it's down and, and you know, trips over. And it, I mean, we're talking, you know, three weeks on the freaking glacier. Yeah, exactly, huge effort, right? That's the point. And here we are at high camp, and we call the climb because of avalanche hazard. And we, don't, we haven't seen any avalanches. It's just sort of a gut feeling the guides are getting, and we've gone out, we've, we've done some, we, we, you know, here's part of it is we, why we didn't have a problem turning people around. We went out, we dug our pits, so we, we poked around, as, so we put a rope team of guides together. We also explored a second route, so we tried another option. We tried waiting for as long as we could to see if things improved. Um, we communicated with other groups at high camp, and nobody was using this route because everyone felt. So, so the writing sort of, you, you can see the process. It wasn't like, well, no, it's, I'm done. You know, I don't like the look of it kind of thing. Right. You know, we, we proved that we were doing our homework, that we were being honest about our decision. And that's, that's part of what you have to do. What's hard, and, and I, can, I empathize with your situation, is that you make a call like that, you, sometimes you wonder, like, oh, maybe that slope was safe. I don't know, like, you know, it just, but when it comes right down to it, it's like you're here to climb again, and, and that's sort of the, the big pictures. 
And oftentimes I'll remind clients, you know, when you're up on a mountain, like, don't forget, man, like, you know, we gotta go home. Like, this is not our life here, up here on this mountain. <laughs> we have other things going on at home, and all the days that led up to this moment, like, you got one decision here, and it's just, why stick your neck out further than you need to? But, thanks, yeah. Sometime yeah. would you address splitting up a group? Yeah, yep. Okay, so solutions to internal hazards. So, okay, so here we are, hazards are, um, you know, like, uh, Let's, let's roll through here a little bit here. Thorough, honest self-evaluation. Um, training, so training is like, uh, you know, doing the training before the climb. Like go and take a course on rope rescue if you're planning on using, you know, just that sort of thing. Avalanche training if you plan on being in the snow. Um, you know, how, beacon training, so on and so forth. And a route plan is something that we're gonna um, try and practice tonight. And it's, it's a tool that I use that that I feel, once I started using it, it kept me a lot more honest about my goals and my expectations on the climb. Things didn't morph into something else like they used to. <coughs> okay, so technical solutions to hazards, obstacles. This is sort of part of the repertoire and guiding, um, and some of you guys may have experience with this and, and like to use this on your trips too, but I just thought I'd throw it in there because it's definitely something that I keep in, in the toolbox, as they say. Um, rope travel for glaciers, fixed lines um, on expeditions, and even on smaller climbs where you just have a short section of exposed terrain and you need it for the way up and the way back down, but they take a lot of time to set up. Lower impelling, belays, running belays, short roping is definitely a guiding skill um, and, and, and takes a lot of practice to, to get the hang of. Um, but modeling and coaching is one that, that you guys um, are going to be able to use a lot because it doesn't take any extra gear. It's just about, um, so modeling is like showing people, like by doing the right technique. If you're climbing something, you know, then you can either show them by like, uh, you know, they say like drop your heel on steep trails because it, it conserves energy in your calves. So things like that, modeling, okay, here, you know, coaching somebody through this, you're having a hard time, let me show you a more efficient technique. Uh, showing someone the rest step if you use that on a longer snow climb, for example. Okay, so here's some pictures. This is me training for um, my rock guide exam, uh, going through. There's a rescue scenario that they run me through, and, and so I'm just running myself back and forth through it on the porch, um, just trying to build up muscle memory, basically. Um, and, and that's the kind of thing, you know, like. A, if you want to learn something, you just got to do it over and over and over again um, until you become really familiar with it. It's just sort of second nature. This is uh, this is my wife um, going um, sort of doing a belayed down climb here. Uh, so an example of a of a technique that's not it's a little obscure. You know, she's not a lower, it's not a rappel, but she's still belayed. Um, this is on the Hope route in uh, in the Alps. Super cool. I mean, do you guys see how much ski track action is going on down here? This is like a ski area, and we're, we're in the back country. This is, but it's a super popular route. Anyway, um, this is a squamer. So this is obviously like vertical rock climbing terrain. You're gonna use a belay with anchors and the whole bit, right? Okay. By the way, this is called the split pillar, and it's probably one of the coolest ditches I've ever climbed. Really, really neat. Um, so guides gear, um, rock climbing rack. So what's what's some gear that you guys bring with you? And and in the list that I put together, it's sort of like an essentials list boiled down. But anything, something that you guys. What's the first thing you throw in the pack? Yeah. Matt. Climbing helmet. Climbing helmet. Good. GPS or compass or both. Yeah. Uh, headlamp. I just I don't care where it is. There's always a headlamp like that. That's a great one. Yep. Rain gear. Rain gear, yep. First aid kit. Food. First aid kit. Food, yep. Okay, so map, uh, route plan, which I took. Sort of, basically, it's my time management plan. You'll you can see that in a minute. Compass. I don't use a compass that much, but maybe it's just habit and the damn thing doesn't weigh a thing. I bring it with me because uh, 
Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's funny. I haven't used it that much, but when you need it, there is no substitute. The compass on this watch is not going to work like a real compass um, on your map, you know. And knowing how to use the things. But, you know, it actually, even like in Glacier Park, for example, like there's, there definitely would be some areas where like, you know, in a whiteout, you might want to be able to shoot a bearing and walk through something just to get to the other side and come out where you want to. But you might also, in a whiteout, want to know what side of a mountain you're on. You know, if you got off the ridge and we're like hiking across the face and then suddenly you're like, okay, well, okay, I'm at 8,000 feet, and, but I don't know what side of the mountain I'm on. You get the compass out and now you can at least tell what aspect you're standing on and looking out at, um, out into the white there. So, altimeter. Altimeter, absolutely. So altimeter, I think, is essential in the mountains. Like, if you can't tell, like, where you are in this axis, um, then yeah, you're you've got a, you're missing a major component to the grid that you're looking at on your map, and a GPS falls into this category too. Cell phone is another one that um, I always bring. Um, yeah, I charge it in the car on the way to the trailhead, and I bring it because at some point in a trip you'll have reception. I mean, in most places in the U.S., and I I don't know, I don't have that much experience <laughs> in the park. Tops of summits, ridges, yeah. up, high. up high. Yeah, I mean that's sort of my thought. Is you know if you're climbing, like at some point, somewhere, you have a cell phone, you'll have reception. Um, so I bring it. Food, shelter, and shelter is clothing, whatever it is. It doesn't necessarily have to be like a tent or a baby sack or something like that. But shelter is just how do you protect yourself from the elements? It could be extra clothing. It could be you know a down jacket. Um, you know when I'm ski touring in the winter just for the day. It's an insulated jacket that I can put on, and you know it's my my cozy sleeping bag that I can wear. That's my shelter, um, and then first aid, and that's you know real basic, right? Like I could apply this to any kind of activity going out in the mountains, um, but by no means is it like this is all I bring ever. Okay, so group management. Um, another cool picture on Denali. Uh, these guys are. Carrying this is a rope team here, and they're carrying their cash. Um, they went from a high camp, went down, picked up a cash, so they had empty packs on the way down, and filled the packs up, and now they're going back up to camp under heavy loads. And uh, so this is uh, how many of you guys have, have, have been to Chamonix, France? Okay, it's Larry, nice. So, so if you, do you know this spot here? Does this look familiar? This is uh, this is the top of the uh, of the Cosmique's uh, what is it the cable car? I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> so the top of the cable car, uh, and this is you know I've seen the winter time. Wow. You uh, <laughs> so they, they, I mean it's just it's bizarre. Like you're they um, carry you up here. At, I don't even know. I think this is probably ten thousand feet, maybe eleven, and it just drops you off from town here. It, you know, amazing feat of engineering, and then you can you can go to the gift shop or you can go to the whatever, and it's all kind of built into the in, into the rock of this mountaintop. And then there's a, a portal where you walk out. There's literally a tunnel like carved out of the snow that then you know it's a white light at the end as you walk out to here. And then there's a sign here that says uh, you are now entering high mountain terrain. No groomed runs, no trail markers. So that, I kind of like this picture because it's like okay. You know, here's the playground. Time, time to have fun, right? We're we're leaving everything else behind, but um, yeah, it's just uh, it's kind of funny. Um, so at that point, that's where you that's where you as the coordinator step in, right? Um, we're we're leaving the familiar world behind of my office, my car, my life, everything that's going on, and I'm putting myself in your hands, the coordinator. You're going to take me up this peak or you know up this valley or whatever. Um, so. Group management strategies, uh, building rapport. I think you know this goes. This is like the, the ropeless guiding. I mean, it's super super powerful. Really important um, to to make an effort to do this, and and make an effort to get better at it. Just in general, like uh, at RMO, you know, like I have to. Like, <laughs> I, I make myself go talk to people, you know, like, and come up with a, a new way to be like, hey, you know, like, what's going on in your day today? And why don't you, you know, tell me what's going on? And it, it's not something, you know, for me anyways, that like just, 
Uh, I'm not a total extrovert where I just it, it just happens for me. It's something I have to work at to make make it happen. But I get great results from it, and that's the part that encourages me to keep doing it. Like I, I learn something about somebody that I'm like, oh, well, that's really cool. And then you know I go home and I tell my wife like, oh, I met this person who did this and did that, and you know, and you'll find I find the same thing you know with guiding. I mean, at once Rainier was like, oh, okay, yeah, I've done Rainier a lot. Uh, I'm not that interested, you know, in August of like what's going on on the DC Cleaver. You know, there's probably rocks falling off of it. So, I what I found is, you know, like to make my trips more interesting, I would get to know my clients, and then every trip was different because it's a different group of people um, getting to know them, and, and yeah. So, um, experience, you know, basically knowing the experience of your group, so getting to know like as part of your report, and what have you done before, you know, what are your goals for the day, what do you want to do, um, what would you like to get out of this experience, uh, that sort of thing. Training, so training as a group management strategy is something that, that you should also consider doing on your trip. So if you have a trip that requires the use of an ice axe, if, you were, if this were a guided trip, part of your um, risk management plan would be to have everyone demonstrate proper ice axe technique before you take them on the mountain. Well, rather than schedule a whole other day to do that, let's just do it on our way up. We're going to take a 15 minute break here at this meadow. There's a nice little snow slope here. We're just going to go over here like you know, for five minutes and do a little self-rest action. And then quickly you'll get a good sense of who's actually held an ice axe in their hand before who's never, you know, um, and that sort of thing, and, and who actually you could trust to be like, oh yeah, yeah, why don't you go off on your own, why don't I walk with you, you know, <laughs> and keep an eye on you, you know, that sort of thing, so it's, uh, yeah, it, it's something that I didn't think of until, you know, going into guided trips and sort of like, oh yeah, totally, we're going to train these guys on the way up, they've never done this stuff before, but somehow we're going to make mountaineers out of them in the next 24 hours, like, how does that happen? <laughs> Well, there you go. Uh, so your size of your group is, is pretty critical. And, and I'm psyched to see a limit because it, you know, the bigger the group, the harder it is to manage it. And that's the reality. And, and the slower it's going to move and all those sort of things. Um, so it's easy to get yourself into trouble in the sense of like wrong uh, objective, uh, you know, climb with wrong group size. And then a pace, this is super general, right? Um, if you just want like, a blanket statement, 1,000 feet an hour and two miles an hour is a very um, doable pace for anybody, in my experience, um, especially this. You know, climbing Mount Rainier, it's a big climb, uh, much bigger than most people have ever done when they sign up for a trip with us. And, but people can do 1,000 feet an hour. It's, it's just, it's doable. Um, so if you keep that in mind, and you know, that's where an altimeter comes in handy, you know, if, so in other words, if people are saying, too fast, too fast, and you're doing 500 feet an hour, it's kind of like, no, this is really slow. You know, you can you have a baseline. So that's why I put that in there. Uh, okay, so here's, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about Mount Rainier. I, I, I realize now I'm <coughs> talking a lot, but, um, it's good, it's good. Okay. Yeah. okay, okay. So Mount Rainier, uh, here's a picture. This is a private climb I did with, with these two folks here, and, and then there was a, a second guide. This is me here. Second guide uh, taking the picture. Very common, white out. We're climbing Mount Rainier, um, and, and when I say style matters, this is kind of pseudo alpine style. So everything we need is in these backpacks. There's nothing, there's no, um, we're not doing uh, a different, so in other words, we're carrying all of our stuff with us every time we move up the mountain. It's pseudo style in the sense that we go to a fixed camp and there is, you know, a camp mirror where we go and there's pots and pans and the stove and, you know, water's already been melted and that sort of thing. Um, but there's other routes that we do where we don't go through camp mirror and everything is on your back. But alpine style just basically means your self-contained unit. Um, so here's a map of Rainier and um, down here is Longmire and Paradise. So this is uh, it's the south side of the mountain, you know, oriented north at the top here. There's the summit. And um, so, uh, you know, and, and what I thought I would do is just kind of, I tell you sort of, and I'll, I'll try and 
roll it along a little bit, but kind of give you a, a verbal description of how we manage a group of clients on a summit climb, which is a, basically a three-day climb of Mount Rainier. Um, and so, you know, how we take a, a group of people we've never met before and, and turn them into mountaineers by the time they get down, or hopefully before. Uh, <laughs> so we, uh, in, in the past, we've come up um, on one day and we've done a, a snow school right up in here, in, and, uh, and that's a, a chance for us to, you know, sort of gauge people's uh, physical fitness, and we teach them self-arrest, and wearing their crampons, they put a rope on, they wear their harness, we want them to bring a certain amount of gear so we can see them, use it, put it on. This is so valuable. Like you don't want to find out that somebody doesn't know how to put their harness on, you know, up here. Um, so this is a nice, comfortable, safe environment. And these are the things you want to think: comfortable, safe environment. That's a good place to train. Um, so this is where you want to find out, you know, that someone, yeah, only has one crampon, or you know, their boots don't fit, or. I don't know, they brought the wrong kind of down jacket. I, you know, whatever it is, it, that's sort of the shakedown is, is the, your first day here. And this, that can also happen um, somewhere else on the route, but as we do it, it's, uh, it, it happens on, on one day on its own here. And then um, the next day we come back up here and we, uh, the objective is to climb up to Camp Muir. And, you know, so in the morning we, we come out, we divide the groups up, the, the guides all kind of stand out, there's sort of this, this like ceremonial performance of like, oh, I'm the guide, and this is my fellow guide, and you know, we've done this, and blah, blah, blah. And you know, and all the clients are standing around kind of going, wow, cool, man. Is that that Beasters? Wow. And, uh, and you know, and, so, and that's part of your rapport building, you know? And, like, it, I always thought like, oh, you know, I still sort of like, oh, you know, whatever, like that, no big deal. But, but it is a big deal. It, it's, it is part of the process of how we quickly take people, you know, that have never climbed together before, put them into a stressful situation, and have everything turn out okay. Um, is, you know, it's basically by, by saying, you know, hey, I'm the guy, I, this is my role, um, here are some of my qualifications, I've done this, I've done that, and, um, you know, and then, and then we talk about the expectations for the day. We're doing all of this, you know, not even on this map. It's down here in Ashford at a different place. And we kind of go through a quick group check. We tell people, here's the plan for the day. Here are the things we're expecting you to have, da, da, da. And uh, whether it's coming up here to do this training day or to start the climb up to camp here. Um, so we do that, we ride up in a bus together, we get a chance to talk there, um, we all hop out of the bus here, we all then kind of reconvene into our groups. So we've been divided into summit climb groups and that'll consist of two to three guides with up to three clients per guide. So that's your ratios, three to one. Um, and then we kind of regroup here in Longmire, you know, sort of do a last check, like okay, anybody wanna use the bathroom? Okay, here's, you know, this is, the ex expectation for the next couple of hours. You know, here we're gonna walk for an hour and then we're gonna take a break. And the weather looks like this, so you know, here's my recommendations for your layering system. You know, Johnny, you look like you got too much stuff on. <laughs> Joey, you don't have a raincoat on and it's nuking out. You know, things like, <laughs> you know, things that you might think are obvious, but take some prodding sometimes um, to get people to, to do. Um, and the other thing, it, it becomes you know, on a sunny day, it's like, okay, sunscreen, everybody wears sunscreen, you know. On a nasty day, it becomes a real thing. When you leave here, uh, I guess basically it's sort of like, you know, if, if, if Camp Muir on a nice day is, well, yeah, let's just say if Camp Muir and that elevation here is kind of like, once you go above this, now you're in the alpine environment, on a really bad day, sometimes that alpine environment starts right out the door here. And uh, you know, you start going up this thing in a freezing rain that's coming off the side because the wind's always blowing this direction across uh, from left to right. And there's nowhere to hide. You can't, like, if someone didn't wear the right thing, there's no place to go and be like, okay, well, let's just get in here real quick and you know, like you can dry that off and you can, you know, reverse your layer system because you've got your base layer on over your down jacket. You know, I don't know what it is, something like that. But um, you know, there's no place to do that. So, so that sort of thing of like having the experience, having been in that situation in the, in the past, you then can sort of front load those things and you save yourself and your client some heartache um, by getting it done here in a safe, comfortable environment. Okay, so 
the pace is 1,000 feet an hour, and basically every hour we take a 15-minute break. And everybody's raring to go, and the first break is like uh, right here. So it just doesn't look very far. And it's not really that far, but it kind of sets the tone for the entire rest of the climb. Um, and it keeps people from getting behind and eating and drinking stuff. So, yeah, it, it's, it's like, I guess if I were doing my own climb, it'd be the first break I'd skip. I'd be like, ah, pff, I've only been hiking for an hour. I've been in the car for two hours and I didn't eat and drink, you know? Like, forget it, I'm, yeah, I'm going. But then it kind of, you know, then you're like even more tired, you know, and more lagging when you get here because there wasn't a good spot here to stop. I don't, you know, it's sort of, by stopping every hour, we train folks, we get into this routine of like, okay, every hour we're stopping, we're eating, we're drinking. And it sets people up for the best possible outcome. So one break, two break, three break, four break, it's about 5,000, no, about 4,000 feet, 4,500 feet, I think, from uh, 4,600 feet, yeah, from Paradise up to Camp Muir. And, uh, and this break, too, sometimes seems like you can see Camp Muir from there. It's like, well, really, you need to stop. But I've also done this whole thing, you know, like, as fast as I could. And, you know, it's like, I mean, you're, okay, for example, when the first time I did this climb from here to here with the guide service, I got up to Camp Muir and I was like, God, I feel great. Like, this is awesome. I don't have a headache. Like, I can still do stuff. And when I had done this before, on my own with my friends, we had just been like, oh, God, I've got to get up there, got to get up there, and like, go as fast as you can. We probably took two breaks, if any, and, you know, we get up there, and it was like, you know, splitting headache, and you're about ready to throw up because you have AMS, and, you know, you climbed up too fast. So you're not acclimatizing as you're going, and you haven't eaten, you haven't drinking, and now you're going to, what, what are you going to do now? Like, you, you can't stay there because you feel like shit. And so you're going to go down, and your trip's done. You know, end of story. Mm -hmm. So going slow, sticking to your pace is important when it comes to climbing something like this. Okay, so we take our breaks, we get up here, and and from here to here, as far as group management, we we have to like force people to take to do this pace. So a guy gets in front, there's a there's usually a boot pack, and we go in single file line, kind of like you see here. So they're using the same footsteps that I'm set here. And, uh, and a lot of times, you know, lots of people have been going up and there's a, a veritable staircase going up there. Um, but I'm, by, I, by being in the front, I can physically block and control the pace of the people behind me. And there's no rope involved, but I'm going slower than anybody wants to out of the gate. But it sets the pace. And by the time, whoops, by the time you get up here, you know, or I mean, sometimes it's even in here, you know, that line starts thinning out and suddenly it's like, Come on, you know, like, we're not going any faster. We're doing the same piece we were doing down there. Um, and so that's where that second and third guy kind of come in and they can help someone. They can have someone step out of the line. So if one person you see like, oh, hey, but, and this involves not being in the front. So if you're in the front, you can't tell what's going on behind you really, right? You're just up there setting the pace. So the guy on the side who's talking with people, you know, sees someone, oh, there, here's a gap forming, you know, let's see if they can catch up. If they don't, you know, then hey, watch, step out. Let's, you know, let the let these guys go by, and then we'll hop in, and then I'll just I'll walk with you. I'll kind of coach you along and help you, and see if we can't figure out what's going on. Sometimes it comes down to like, you know, you're taking weight from people. Once that happens, then we say, you know, look, if, if I'm taking weight from you now on the trip, you're not going to go above Camp Muir. We can we can make Camp Muir our personal high point. You know, we can get up there, and that's super cool. You can spend the night up there, but just know that, you know, if you're having trouble today, tomorrow is tough. So, so you can see we're sort of, you know, we're front-loading. I'm, I'm explaining what the expectations are. If you can't keep the pace, like, this is the pace we're going to keep tomorrow, and then we're all going to be on a rope, and we can only go as fast as the slowest person in the group. So, um, so camp here, spend the night. Um, we do a summit talk. So we get everybody together and the guides come in and we say, okay, so here's what tomorrow's like and we break it down, you know, like here the first leg is like this and it's gonna feel like that. And you know, this will be your chance to use the bathroom. And here, you know, like the things that you're trying to like sort of figure out what are people worried about? What are the things that they're gonna wanna know? What are they gonna wanna know when they're gonna eat, when they're gonna drink, where they can go to the bathroom, you know, how are they gonna deal with these certain things? 
And, uh, and so you try to explain all that stuff and, and about how long you think it's going to take and sort of what the you know, circumstances are of like, you know, you know, what would happen if I don't know, somebody gets hurt or if you see rock fall or you, know, you just can't go on any further and you want to turn around. Then what happens? You know, you, so all those things, there's a, there's a plan in place for that. And that makes people feel more secure. Like, oh, it reduces their anxiety. Like, great, they have a plan. Someone's going to turn around with me. You know, if I can't do it, it doesn't mean everybody can't do it. Like, you know, so those sort of things. So, um, so the next day, then you know, we get up at midnight or whatever it is, and we're we're headed across this glacier. And this first stretch is pretty basic, I, and and this is kind of um, I, <laughs> this this spot. If, if people have trouble in here, because there's very there's about a thousand feet of elevation gain between Camp Muir and Ingraham Flats. That's a pretty good indicator that this is just not going to be their day, you know. Like, and, and it could be any number of things. Something could have happened between yesterday and the day before. It could be that someone had a little bit of trouble here, and we sort of, you know, we're like, eh, tomorrow's going to be tough. You know, it's going to be a lot harder than it was today. You know, and then usually like this first stretch kind of seals the deal for him. It's like, okay, you know, that was tough too. I, I don't think this is my day. And and so folks will folks can turn around here, and uh, and this is. You know, as a guide, um, this is sort of the last spot where you want to have somebody who really shouldn't be going any higher, um, which is someone who, you know, is stumbling or um, is basically just sort of could be a potential hazard to everyone else. Because we're tied together at this point. We're on the glaciers. We've got crampons on. It's dark. Um, you know, we don't have much weight on us as far as you know, weight in our packs, but it, it's for real. There's definitely consequences at this point. Um, you know, if somebody takes a fall and doesn't say anything in the dark, you're not necessarily going to hear it or see it. Uh, and then, you know, the first thing that you'll find out, or when you'll find out, is you're going to get yanked. So, you know, and just getting yanked off your feet is the kind of thing where like, you can just twist your ankle, you know, get a bum knee, and, you know, it's just, it's just not worth it. Um, so this is, this is a spot, you know, and we know that as the guides. Like, okay, because this next stretch is here onto the disappointment cleaver, because that's your next break at the top of the cleaver. And the cleaver is tough. This is like if early season it's steep snow, um, in later season it's loose, rubbly rock, and you don't take your crampons off. You just march right up with your crampons on. And there's definitely exposure in here, and it's a long stretch. It's more like uh, 13 to 1400 feet up to the top of here, and that's the only real spot to stop and take a break. There's really not a good spot anywhere else down in here um, on the cleaver to, to stop. So that's part of what you're going to talk about here is like, okay, this is the, this is the cleaver, guys. Like, if anybody has any question about you know whether they think they can make it today, like now's the time to voice that, and, and you know we can talk about it because next step, you know, next same pace, but it's longer. Go ahead. So if you make that determination, then. Do you have to take a guide and send them back down so you lose one of your guys? Yeah, okay. yeah, and so you, and exactly, and so you sort of start to get into this like this parallel story that's playing out in the guide's mind. It's like, okay, I'm losing a guy. Is there anybody else who needs to go down? Because I can't just keep peeling guides for every single person that wants to go down. I'm going to run out of people, you know, and, and then I am going to turn people that that could go on. Um, but you know, we're also. You, at this spot here, there are there were three summit climbs that left here, so there were potentially um, nine guides that left uh, Camp Muir and went up to uh, the Abraham Flats. And and there's there's rule you can't put more than three people on your rope, but you can have two people on your rope, and you can move people from one climb to another climb. If that's you know like keep your numbers sort of together, but you can mix and match, and all the groups work together in that sense. Um, so, so you climb up here, everything went great. This is definitely a long haul. People are pretty soft. And now the sun's coming up. It's awesome. Like, Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Do you find that the people who can't make it at that point in time, that you and they are in agreement? Is there usually yeah. a meeting of the mind? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. It, it's it's usually pretty pretty self apparent. Yeah, you know it's um, you're not trying to trick somebody. You know this is it, it, you're talking about real things. You know, um, and it it just it makes sense to people. And and, and folks know like you know I mean um, 
it, when people are, are really let down, um, what, I, what I do tell folks is that, you know, this, uh, the limitation of signing up for the group summit climb is that you, you, I can't take special care of you. If you come on a private climb and it's me and you and another guide, we can go as slow as you want. We can camp our way up this mountain in a week. You know, like, and that's that's kind of the bottom line. Like, so there, and that's the style, right? Like, the style in which we choose to climb this mountain, in this scenario, is basically a two-day climb. And for some people, that's not slow enough. You know, and that doesn't mean that they can't climb Mount Rainier. It just means that they need to be on a different style trip. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. I recall a bag and tag method used by guides. I don't know if that's still in use. Did they? <laughs> no, they, yeah. they, that was so. That was a policy that we, that the Park Service had um, when I started working our fur in here. And so we here we would to save you know to not turn a guide around. We would set up a tent here at the flats, and there all the guides had a sleeping bag with them. And so you could put two people in that tent. And you know it was anchored into the snow, and they'd be in their sleeping bags, and they would just go back to bed, which a lot of people, quite frankly, at two in the morning are happy to do. <laughs> and more than once, I looked in there and was like, I wouldn't mind hopping in there. <laughs> um, and we we also had left people up here, which is not this. I feel like is pretty legit. Um, this is less so. There was no tent. They got a sleeping bag and a picket as an anchor, and they were tied to the picket, their harness. And there's all kinds of stories of like, you know, guys taking their boots so they wouldn't just leave. And then, you know, other times where like, you know, I don't know, someone did leave and left the sleeping bag there, and they just walked off, and so sort of like, oh god, I like lost the client. You know, yeah. I, I, I have, I have left people here. Uh, I never had any, you know, mishaps with that. Um, but I'm not, I, it's, I'm not disappointed that that policy is no longer in effect with the Park Service. But yeah, at this point, you cannot leave a client unattended. And that's what, where, where it comes down to. So, so you'd have to leave a guy here with the tent. Or anything, so. so now we don't have to carry a tent, which is great. <laughs> um, so top of the cleaver, this is basically the last point where I would turn anybody around. So in other words, people need to be looking pretty good here. And then, if they're looking good here, they're going to the top. Because uh, we take one more break between the top of the cleaver and the summit, and it's kind of like, I mean, to turn someone around there, it's like you've done 95% of the climb. You're going to be as knackered at that point uh, by the time you get back here as you are if you've just gone up and tagged the summit and came back down. So <laughs> as a guide, you need to do a good job here of like, you know, getting, getting through to folks. And it, and it can be tough. This is the tough spot right here. because. People have done a tough climb. A lot of them are just are, are tired. You're like, I mean, it's still early, early in the morning, and you work really freaking hard, and like, you know, you got like the, the sweat or whatever, like the goo kind of in the corner of your mouth. You breathe <laughs> hard. And you're like, you know, you're not looking your best, and someone's trying to talk to you about like, okay, can you think you can do it? You know, and it's like, I don't know. <laughs> so, so it, this is this is a tough spot here. It, you know, it, it's. Interesting if you guys ever climb, you know, if you do do Rainier on the DC route, you, you should just, after hearing that, I, I would imagine it would be fun to kind of just see the guides, the stories unfurl, you know, in front of you and, and maybe listen to some of these talks that go on here because it's, uh, it, it, it would be interesting as a fly on the wall. We all want to go with you now. Great. All right. Well, I, yeah, I'll be there this summer. <laughs> so, um, yeah, are you joking, aren't you? No. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> So, so this, um, so, so yeah, so this spot basically, you know, you really want to check in with people. Okay, you got two more sections coming up ahead here. You just, you just, and, and we've been saying this the whole way up. Like here, on, you know, as we're coming up, you know, we're we bring people in tight, so we kind of do a pseudo short roping on the cleaver because you're not on crevasses, but you're actually on rock terrain, and you want to do a lot of the coaching modeling stuff because. You want to keep the rock fall to a minimum for the other groups that are behind you. So you want to have, you know, you want to be able to sort of walk sideways and look at your folks and watch their feet as they're climbing and see, you know, like is somebody like stumbling and tripping, like that sort of sign of fatigue, right? And um, discoordination, that kind of thing. I don't know if that's really a word, discoordination, but you know, it's just sort of showing signs of 
sort of running out of steam. Um, so, so everyone's close here, and so you can talk to people too. You know, as you're coming up, and you're walking slow. Like, I mean, we're talking 1,000 feet an hour looks like this. You know, like, okay, so guys, you were getting up to the top of the cleaver. Like, you know, this is, this is, you need to be feeling good coming into this break here, because after this, we're going to the top. Like, there's no, there's no like, okay, I'm, I'm done. You can't throw the towel in up higher without doing that. Um, you know, and of course you can if you have to, but you don't want to. At that point, we want everybody up uh, who leaves the top of the cleaver. And, and we've said that here. You know, we want every, everyone who leaves the top of the cleaver, we want them to go to the summit. That, they heard that here, they're going to hear it here, and they're going to hear it here. And, uh, and so, you know, so again, we're just we're being straightforward about expectations and what's going on. And here I kind of I drew the route. Uh, the route does a lot. It changes. It goes, uh, some years it's gone all the way over here towards Gibraltar Rock and then back over. Um, it's gone all the way over here sometimes too to what's called, this is the Emmons shoulder. And then we've gone all the way out here into the Emmons as well and come back. And it's all about how the crevasses open up in here. And there's some giant ones that just, they just go, you know, and so you, you end up walking along the side of this crevasse, you know, hoping to find some place where we can, you know, get to the end of it. Um, and then you take one more break. And this, these sections, so this was, this was definitely an hour, but really it's like, it ends up being an hour and 10 minutes, hour and 10 minutes, hour and 10 minutes, hour and 10 minutes. You know, because you end up walking slower than a thousand feet an hour, and it's steeper, and there's no need to, to be rushing people up here um, in this stuff, because it, you know, it's steep, and there's, there's real potential up here. Um, if there was down here, there's even more up here. Summit, we come across the crater rim, and then we, we just drop bags right here, and, and this is the spot where, like, if somebody, if somebody should have been turned around here and then ended up getting up here, or if somebody just ran out of steam in this last stretch, a lot of times I'll just say, you made the top, just have a break. We're gonna be here for 30 minutes or so. Like, you'll get a real break if you just sit on your pack and, and chill out. Um, but everyone has the option to walk across the crater to uh, the high, the true high point, um, the Columbia Crest over here on this side. And it, it, but it takes another 15 or 20 minutes to do that, go over, take your pictures, come back, and all that. And, and sometimes it's just really nice to, to have people kind of just sit and chill out for a little while and get to eat and drink. And that's something, you know, like the higher you get on this mountain, the more you have to remind people, you got to eat, you got to drink. Like, have you had something to eat? Because people will not eat. They'll just, they don't feel good. You know, you've been working hard. It's really early in the morning. It's just not the usual time that you eat. And it doesn't, you know, nothing seems appealing. But it's like literally like unwrap it for them, give it to them. Like you have to eat this, you know, like that kind of. I mean, because in the end, what you put in your stomach has a lot to do with how my climb goes on this trip. Like if you run out of energy and can't walk, that means I'm going to be out here for that many more hours, walking slower, helping you figure stuff. You know, like. All this stuff starts to add up, right? So people are tired. Everyone's tired up here, and we need to be taking care of ourselves the whole time that we're going up, so that you know you can keep things going. It's a, it's a freaking marathon, you know. Like you gotta stop and refuel. So summit, everybody's happy. We head down. We take uh, elevation. Elevation fourteen thousand four hundred and ten feet. Oh, something like that. Maybe eleven feet. <laughs> Uh, on the way down, we, uh, we do sort of like, okay, you know, everybody's back on the road now. Because once you get in the crater, there's no crevasses that I've seen anyways. There's some uh, whole, uh, caves around the edge, but um, we take people off the rope so everybody can walk at their own pace. We get back on the rope, we kind of do a, you know, a shakedown before we head down, right? Like kind of like, okay, everybody heads up, look at me in the eye, like, you know, okay, we're all good. You know, you're listening to me, we've had something to eat, we've had something to drink. Here's the deal, you know, we're gonna go down this far, you know. So again, I'm explaining what's going on, what's to be expected. We take one break right here, so we skip that middle break. Um, in general, you know, in pace, you're taking about half as much time on your way down as you did on the way up. So, and, and you know, that's an in general. Um, and then we take another break here, and then we kind of start talking about what it's like at Camp Muir, and what the rest of the walk down is. So all of this is roped up climbing, we get here and then we, you know, like here I tell people, okay, so here's the deal. We, we're going to get back to Camp Muir. You guys will take like an hour, hour and a half break, which never seems like it's long enough. Um, <laughs> but, 
that's the amount of time, you know, we need to pack up our stuff. Here's what I would recommend you do. Get your gear just packed up and then sit on your pack and chill out and veg. Um, just so that way it's done and you know you got that stuff taken care of. And uh, and then um, and then we're gonna walk down. But the rope's gonna be off. You know, you can make a decision at that point as the guide of whether or not you want people to be wearing crampons as they leave camp near. Sometimes late season there's ice up here or it's really firm and you know you just people need to be having crampon crampons on. But in general, the, you know, we don't wear a rope in here. I have stepped over a number of crevasses right in here in the late season, um, just FYI. And uh, I don't necessarily want to start carrying a rope up um, this whole section here, um, or down it, or roping up for this part, for those crevasses. But it's kind of one of those gray areas where like, you know, our protocol is rope on a glacier, except when you're on your snowfield. <laughs> Which they don't consider a glacier. Got crevasses. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, I, I'm just saying, you know, it, it, I agree. Like, it's sort of one of those things. Like, I don't really know the answer uh, as the guy walking up the hill. Like, I don't want to care.